about how they're struggling with finance. People are speaking about how um, they can't seem to find any money. Uh, young people are, are looking for uh, particular avenues. Uh, but today on the show, we have a special guest, the managing director of Uganda's leading bank, Patrick Mohiri. Welcome to the Cedric Live Show. On the show with me today is the managing director of Uganda's leading bank, Patrick Mayhew. Patrick, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, and I'm really honored. I know you're a busy man. Yes. And uh, uh, it's, it's always good uh, to have people like you on the show who can offer us some sort of guidance. Yes. Um, you know, the, the economy of Uganda today, you know, a lot of people are complaining. I don't even think it's just Uganda. I think it's generally in Africa... Um, in the world, a lot of people are complaining about the economy. But you head up Uganda's leading bank. Is, is it correct that's to say correct. you are Uganda's leading bank? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, because, uh, uh, and that's determined by profitability, isn't it? And size of balance sheet. Size of balance sheet. Yeah. How, big, how big is Standard? I mean, in terms of, uh, I know you, uh, Standard Bank board. Uganda Commercial Bank many years ago. Yeah. How big is Stanbic in, in, in that regard? You know? So we've got assets of four and a half trillion, uh, which four is quite significant. Yeah. Uh, we generate revenues roughly of 800 billion. And last year we generated a profit after tax of 215 billion. Roughly 30% market share of the profitability in the industry. The bank in, is in all the banks. Yeah. How many banks are there in Uganda? 24. 24 banks. But uh, six are loss making. So it's a bit, it's a tough sector. So only 18 are making profit. Yeah. Does that include the, the microfinance banks? Like no, no, these are just tier one commercial banks. Okay. Yeah. The so are banks like Centenary Bank now tier one banks? Yeah. Centenary so they've sort of graduated to the, yes, to the, to the next level. Yes, Centenary is a solid number two bank. Yeah, ah, good. Yeah. So how many branches does Stanbic have in this country? About 80. 80. Yeah, but branches have stopped being really a measure of uh, distribution because yes. we recently launched agency banking. Yes. Um, so in addition to the 80 branches we have, we have almost 2,000 agents who actually can do a lot of uh, deposit taking, cash withdrawals, just like you would in a, in a branch. So the branches have moved away from being just the only way you deal with your customers. Yes. Um, in fact, in, as I speak now, almost 85% of all our transactions go through either digital, only 15% of what we do in, in the number of transactions actually come through a physical branch. Yeah. So it's not like when we were growing up where a bank branch was the end and be all of everything. Yes. It's changed dramatically. ATMs, agency banking, you know, internet banking, mobile banking, that's where transactions are getting executed. Yeah, I mean, I see the advent of mobile money is just crazy, you know, everybody's transacting online and, mm -hmm. you know, using the Standbic app and other banking apps and things like that. So I suppose, uh, but how do you compete with things like that? You know, as a bank, I'm sure those are competitors to your typical banking solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you compete with those? Do you just have to keep creating yourselves or what? Well, at the end of the day, I think the banks have one competitive advantage is that we, we own the customer. Yes. So we have the customer relationship. Um, even though there might be some other functionality that might come from a third-party provider yes. that may enable a payments uh, or, or just make something simpler for you, but the core of your relationship belongs to Stanley. Yeah. And I think that if banks can remain core to managing just the relationship, uh, they will continue to win. I think if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have argued that we were under major disruption by the fintechs and they were going to take our lunch. I have yes. completely changed my view now yes. uh, because I think many of those fintechs can never really penetrate the customer. Just for purposes mm -hmm. of the viewers, mm -hmm. what's a fintech? A fintech is a financial technology company. Okay. You see many of them, pay away, uh, that you see that you can pay your DSTV, Umeme, Easy Money, whatever. Easy Money, all those are fintechs. And they've all come and chipped away at some of the payments uh, that, you know, market share that we used to. But they've failed to kind of backward integrate into owning the customer because yes. there are two barriers to entry. One is to, in order to be a bank, you have to have capital. Yes. Um, and there are minimum capital requirements and there are also minimum compliance requirements. And then it's a heavily regulated industry. And fintechs, we start in a garage with a few guys, a few smart guys, have found it very difficult to go backwards. Yeah. So in a way, we found that we're in a very nice ecosystem where we're complementary to each other. 
Each one is going to be good at what they are. Yeah. We're good at managing money, risk, and, and having the capital. Yeah. They're good at moving quick and creating some really nice functional and customer experience things. And then, you know, we, we all find a happy medium. But, but I, th I think the, you know, the argument that they are going to come and become banks is probably behind us now. So in layman's terms, you know, we, we always like to go home to mom. Mm. You know, to uh, <laughs> to have the home cooked meal and yeah. and keep things as simple as possible. Mm. Look up and see your your bank statement. You know, sometimes when it's up there on mobile money, you tend to feel a bit uh, insecure. Uh, you know, you're not sure. Mm -hmm. System goes down. You know, like, well, how how can I not do X, Y, and Z? Yeah. Uh, now it takes me forward a little bit. You know, there there are complaints. Uh, I wouldn't say complaints, but you know, not like a few years ago, where there seemed to be a lot of cash in the economy. Mm. Um, what's your take on the economy of Uganda today? Uh, currently, okay. as we currently, speak. Currently, as we speak, and I think beginning June of last year, we've seen significant turnaround in momentum, in economic activity, in GDP growth. Yes. If you recall, 2016, 2015, we were struggling with 4% growth, yes. which is dismal for us because population growth alone is 35 Yes. So to grow at 4% is unacceptable. We need to be in the 7 8%. Okay. That's when you start having income per capita growth expansion and people are coming out of poverty. Is that where we are now? We're at 6 and a half. Okay. And, that's, and we have had two, three quarters now of 6.5% growth. And that's very significant. And we've started to see that translate into... There's another measure that we have. We bankers call private sector credit growth. Yes. In layman terms, that is the demand for capital. Yes. Um, if you have low GDP growth and a very low sentiment, investor sentiment, yes. people don't invest. They don't go out and build new plants. They don't come and borrow. And we saw that as well. When GDP was depressed, we also saw private sector demand depressed. Yes. But again, starting in June last year, we started seeing um, 11, 12, 13 percent. We're now seeing very high double-digit growth in credit growth. And those are two measures that really give you a sense of the temperature of the economy. Yes. Um, so it's looking good. I'm, I'm quite optimistic yeah, about no, 2019. You can, see, you can see things like in the construction industry, you can see buildings coming up and people taking up commercial properties, mm -hmm. uh, people taking up apartment complexes and building and selling. So it seems to be vibrant. They might complain, mm -hmm. but they seem to be doing quite well. No, absolutely. Uh, and it looks like... Uh, I think I saw a couple of banks opening here as well. Mm -hmm. The last couple of years, like uh, the CBA and people like that. So there must be something that, that's good in the economy that's attracting them. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to cut to commercial. When we get back, we're going to talk about which sectors you think have positive outlooks mm -hmm. in the economy. Welcome back to the Cedric Live Show. I'm here with the Managing Director of Uganda's leading bank, Stan Big Bank, Patrick Mohiri. Patrick, we're talking about the economy. Um, and uh, before we went to commercial, I, I wanted you to tell us and the viewers, uh, which sectors in, in the view, in your view and the view of maybe the bank, have positive outlooks? Where should we be looking, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the economy? Yeah. First and foremost, agriculture. I think at the end of the day, agriculture is probably the biggest gift that Uganda has received. 50% um, of arable land in East Africa is in Uganda. Uh, but somehow we've not been able to crack it. I've um, heard we can feed Africa three times. I don't know about Africa three times, but we're the only net food exporter in the region. So yeah. Kenya imports, Tanzania imports. So it's a huge competitive advantage. But in order to leverage that, there's some basic organization that has to happen in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can fix that value addition the president keeps talking about, agro-processing, where you actually remove some of the uh, wastage and leakage, uh, improve shelf life of, of, you know, if you take a pineapple and, you know, basically process it, it can live a lot longer, or mango, etc. You've got to dry it. To and dry it out or even make juice out of it. So there's a lot left on the table. Um, I saw some really shocking statistics that there was 30% post-harvest loss in some crops. That is really a lot of waste. But despite all of that, 80% of Uganda's are employed in agriculture. So you 80%. can... 80%? 8-0. Mm. 
you cannot move the needle of this country without playing in agriculture. The good news is that last year it grew significantly, uh, almost 20%, in terms of demand for credit. And I think that that's going to grow significantly as yeah. well next year. We were, for the first time, we had net food um, or net trade surplus with Kenya, largely driven by maize because they had a small drought over there. I think that's going to repeat this year. Yes. So agriculture's got a huge potential and great future. There are some you know, structural challenges that we have to deal either from a policy point of view or the, the, the land tenure system that makes you know, a lot of the, the land sizes a bit small so they're not yes. ideal for yield. But if we can fix that, I think agriculture can feed this country and actually li you know, lift our income per capita uh, significantly. Yes. The other key sectors I would talk about, consumer. Uh, so if you look at you know, whether it's Coke or Pepsi or the juice guys, they're all doubling capacity because okay. there's demand. And you can, when you think about our demographics, where we add, we add 1.2 million babies a year. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, well, seven, yeah. uh, seven, we have 30 million people under 30. Yeah. So that's from 1986 to now, that's a big boom. Huge boom, and, and it keeps boom. growing, 3.5%. Yeah. So you can imagine that the market, set, the market demand for yogurt, milk, you know, juices to school. So that, that ripple effect, yes. again, of 1.2 million babies, uh, diapers, all that stuff adds up. Yes. So we're seeing that agriculture, then the consumer sector, also pick up significantly. These are the fast-moving consumer goods. Fast-moving consumer goods, yes. yes. Tied into the demographics. Soap, everything. Yeah, yeah. all that, yeah. you know, oils and etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, lately, we've started to see manufacturing come back, but it's very segmented. It seems like the larger manufacturers are doing better than the smaller ones. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the roofings of this world, etc., the guys who have an export market and a very nice like oil. Like and people. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, distribution platform, they're yeah. doing okay. Uh, real estate still kind of limping along. Uh, but I think there's a lag effect with some of these sectors because the consumer demand and, and you know, sort of um, ability to spend has to come back first yes. before people go into that. But I think that since we've seen GDP come and some of these other key sectors grow, including personal lending, personal lending, that's people borrowing for their own personal use, which sometimes, you know, can translate into SMEs. It's not just money they're consuming. It yes. might be money they're investing in a small business. Yes. That also came back 20%. Yes. So that, that income then comes in later and mm -hmm. starts to feed some of the longer-term industries like real estate, etc. Yes. But it's all looking positive. Yeah. I think real estate, the issue is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a money game. Uh, mm. You know, you have to have money to invest in real estate. Mm. And one thing I, I wanted to ask, you know, because the infrastructure in Uganda is improving. Okay, even in the urban areas. If you look at Kampala now, you know, a few years ago, there was no Chiwatule yeah. in terms of, there was no Nigeria, Akira, mm -hmm. uh, and further and further. So, of course, it's reduced the pressure on, on the typical urban areas, which are Kololo, Bugolobi, mm -hmm. Nakasero. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, when, you know, when I was growing up, you know, if you went beyond a certain point, you know, it was hard to find uh, basic services. Basic yeah. services. Yeah. But now, you know, people are doing developments as far as Kira, Gayaza, mm -hmm. and still working. Mm. In, in the CBD because mm. of the, the bypass and things like that. Mm. So uh, may, may, maybe it's, I'm just a uh, question, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's people biding their time. You know, they yeah. bought up the, the bits and pieces, and now it's a second generation of people who are now deciding what to do with their money. There, there's one piece that's lacking, which is the affordable housing piece. Yes. Um, you know, I think a lot of people in their first jobs, you know, five years out of school, uh, simply cannot raise the capital to go and buy, you know, a, a massive 300, 400 million shilling house because you need a lot of equity. How do you save that money? And the old days that of building a brick by brick and taking 10 years to build your house is just not efficient anymore because you lose a lot of it in the inflation costs, you know, of building materials going up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a segment there of houses from the 50, 150 million shilling that needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. um, where you can just walk in, you know, right, you know, you're two years out of school, uh, and you can match that mortgage payment or whatever it costs you to buy that house to what you would pay in rent. Yes. And that's one of the things we're trying to unblock, to see how to bring affordability down, uh, but the houses have to also be cheap, because you c there's only so much you can do with financial engineering if, if the house is 500 million. But if it's 100 million, we can figure out a way in which you know, it does make sense for somebody earning a million shillings to start owning a home. 
but the supply and affordable housing has to change. You know, one thing I want to ask, and I've never really understood, you know, and of course because I've had the, the you know, I've been blessed to travel and live in other countries, um, the interest rate mm. um, probably plays a part in what you're saying. Uh, because uh, I understand it's the central bank that sets mm. uh, the, the lending rate and then the commercial banks have to set uh, mm. a rate on which they also make uh, a, a living, mm. so to speak, or, or, or have a balance sheet. Mm. But at 20%, 23, 24, 25%, I don't know what it is now exactly today, but for example, on a home loan, mm. if you're borrowing 100 million shillings at 20, 20, 20%. That's 18%. We, our okay, it's so 18%. 18. Yeah. So just your interest is 18 million shillings mm. on 100 million. If I'm just using yeah, maths basically. plus fees or whatever it is. And your salary is a young guy, uh, 1.5 million. Mm. So basically, you don't have anything left. And mm. the bank won't even approve your mortgage. Mm. because they can only take a certain percentage. I think it's 30% or 50%. 80, you know, we, can, we can give up to 80%. Of the salary. Oh, you mean, oh, I thought of the mortgage. You know, when they're doing the due diligence on oh, yeah, the, yeah, on, yeah. On, on Of the course, person. we want to leave something for you to live. You can't yeah, borrow yeah, you 100% can't, of your salary. Yeah, so you can only borrow... Up to 60 70%. 60%, 70%, which means maybe 600000 which probably is not going to service your 100 million shilling loan. Mm. I don't know what the mathematics are. But I know the interest rates are quite high. Mm. So what do you think is maybe the short-term, medium-term, or even the long-term solution to this, this particular issue of interest rates? Mm. Okay, so two things to answer that question. One is that um, I'll point out a few facts about the banking industry. Now, we're going to go to commercial. Okay. And then we'll come back and we'll start with the interest rates. Okay. All right. Cheers. <laughs> Welcome back to the Cedric Live Show. We're still here with the Managing Director of Stand Big Bank, Patrick Moyer. Patrick, we're talking about the interest rate yep. and uh, how uh, they, you know, at least they can be a bit stifling, mm -hmm. especially for, for people trying to start up businesses, SMEs, mm -hmm. uh, for young people trying to get mortgages. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as you said, it's anywhere between 18% and 25%, depending on which bank you're speaking to. Stand Big, of course, you say is at 18%. Mm -hmm. How how are we go, how are we going to overcome this challenge? Because you know, you know, you you were in the you were a banker in, mm. in different countries, and mm. you know people are borrowing money at three percent and, and even an increment of a, a point is, is, it causes havoc, mm. you know. And this is three percent to five percent. Uh, in some countries, it's it's LIBOR plus one, you know. Uh, so you're basically like I guess in China, Japan, borrowing money at at, at zero percent. Yeah. Um, so how do we, how is this, how, how is it as bankers, uh, yourself as, 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 as the leading um, head of the biggest bank in Uganda, the central bank and the other banks, how are they trying to address this? Mm. It's a good question. I answer that in two ways. One is that um, there is the monetary piece that you were talking about, which mm -hmm. is when the government sets the price of money, um, which also then sets the tone for lending in the economy. So if the government's borrowing one-year money at 15%, mm -hmm. that's risk-free rate. Um, I've obviously got to add a risk premium to lend you the money. Yeah, which is the 3% you the Yeah, money. exactly. So now that the issue whether government should be borrowing at 15%, I'm just going to park that for a moment because yes. that's not really, uh, that's above my pay grade. Yes. Uh, now let's talk about the other piece, which are the structural issues. And I'll point out a few things. One, even with these high interest rates, like I said earlier, there's six, seven loss-making banks. Yes. The return on equity in the entire banking sector in Uganda is 15%, mm -hmm. which is quite low. Uh, global average should be about 25. So okay. even with a high entry rate of a, of a you know, sticker rate, the, the return on the banking sector in Uganda is quite low. So mm -hmm. the question is why? And the question comes in, the answer is in cost. So the cost to income ratio, which is how much it costs you to make a dollar of revenue, cost to income, 
cost income ratio in Uganda is 68%. Mm -hmm. The global average is 50. On average, it should cost you 50 cents to make $1 of revenue. Yes. Here, it costs you close to 80 cents to make $1 of revenue. That's before taxes? Yeah. That's just be, that's profit before tax. So, so, so technically, what you're actually saying is that you're already losing money before you start. No, I mean, because imagine that, uh, that that's the cost, but that includes salaries and everything else. But if you add in the 30% on taxes and at 80%. 80, 80 but, that's, but that's why they're loss-making banks. I mean, uh, some banks actually have more cost than they have revenue. Yes. So let's address the real issue. Yes. The real issue is there's a very high cost of doing business okay. in the banking sector in Uganda. Yes. And that is one of the things that I'm trying to work on now as the chairman of the Bankers Association is how do we reduce the cost of doing business? Mm -hmm. How do we collaborate more? I'll give you a simple example, a cash in transit cost. This is a big cost item for banks. What Move, is cash in transit? So moving cash from Moroto back to Kampala. Okay. Effectively. In those trucks that those you see. Those trucks. Yeah, know. back and forth. I mean, banks spend billions spending money, you know, moving cash around the economy. But we all have our specific trucks. So if the Barclays truck is half empty, behind is a Centenary, which is a third empty, and then Stanvik has a quarter empty. And we're saying, that's ridiculous. Why can't we figure out a way to outsource cash and all share the cost? So that one van takes all our cash to Moroto and charges us once. Right. ATMs. How many times have you been to a mall and you find eight ATMs next to each other? Yeah, I mean, I see so many. Yeah. Does that make sense? No. Half of those ATMs don't get used. All you need to do is to put the inter-switch or whatever it is. Exactly. We should collaborate. In fact, what we're, we're trying to do something radical, which is can we put all the ATMs into one company and, right. and make that, you know, and then just uh, have a shared platform. Yeah, banks. everybody has a share of yeah. that particular platform. So these are the things that are going to bring the cost of doing business down. Because until you address that, um, even if you were to reduce interest rates and force it, you would immediately take another 10 loss, another 10 banks in the sector into loss making. Right. How, what good would that do? So I think it's better we address the real issue. Mm -hmm. Now there will be the other issue on the monetary piece and I think it's, it's important that I also explain. Uh, there is a reason why a shilling rate is higher than a dollar rate. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you came to borrow dollars from us and there are some customers who earn dollar revenue that can borrow dollars, yes. we don't lend to them at 18%. Yeah, of course, it's much it's lower. It's much lower. Why? Why is that the case? Because of the inflation. So the Ugandan currency depreciates 3 to 5, 5, five to 7 percent a year. So if inflation is 5 percent, mm -hmm. that is your base rate um, before you can. So when you say 13 uh, or 18 that we're lending in shillings, you have to remove the inflation bit to start to compare it to dollars. Yes. Because, you know, if you're looking at the base rate in dollars, and your shilling is depreciating. If you're paying a dollar interest rate, effectively you're actually paying that back in inflation because your currency is depreciating. Mm -hmm. So you can never do it. It's not an apples to apples comparison to yeah, say yeah, yeah. a dollar rate and a shilling rate. Because the, the inflation rates are different yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, and what is your take on the, the oil and gas industry in Uganda? There's a lot of talk about it. Mm. The, you know, I know a couple of years ago everybody was going absolutely bananas. They were buying. Uh, land in, in, in Hoima and in that part of the country, people were uh, borrowing uh, futuristically um, logistics companies and, and for that reason some of them have suffered. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what's your view on the oil industry? Yeah, I mean I think there were a few people that moved quickly and you yeah. can't blame them. We'd never found oil in Uganda. So there were some casualties along the way. People yeah. who invested too quickly, too soon, were too optimistic. Yes. Um, but many of us were. I mean, this oil was found more than 10 years ago. Yeah. We did not think it would take this long to get to this point. Right. But there's a silver lining in that. The fact that we've taken this long is that there's some lessons that have been learned the way. And, and if you look at our oil and gas policy in general and how everything's been put together, yes, it's taken a while, but it has actually taken some risks out of the system. Yes. Having a you know, petroleum authority, a regulatory authority, separating the minister as a policy person and having an authority that enforces the regulation. Yes. Um, you know, fighting those tax wars that generated some money for the government. So yes, there's a silver lining in that we benefited from some of the delays to get ready. Yes. But it is time that we actually made that final investment decision. Yeah, I've been reading about that. And uh, I remember having a conversation 
about two or three days ago mm. uh, with the logistics company. And uh, they, you know, it, it shook them a little bit that there was a delay in, in the final investment decision. Yeah. Um, when we get back from the break, we'll talk about this a bit more. Okay. And then maybe talk about uh, Patrick as a banker, you know, and how okay. you ended up in this industry. Uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Cedric Live Show. I'm still here with Patrick Muhiri, the Managing Director of Uganda's leading bank, Stanbic Bank. So Patrick, we're talking about the final investment decision in the oil industry. Mm -hmm. I was sitting with some people the other day and they were they, 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 they're in the logistics business and they, they were a bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was the tone I got from them. Yeah. What's your take on this financial investment decision? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, first of all, it's it's important to mention how critical that decision is for Uganda yes. uh, because it's going to unleash an investment, foreign direct investment, of about 15 to 20 billion dollars over the money. next three to five years. So if you add a pipeline of about three and a half billion, a refinery three and a half, the upstream development about nine billion, that's real money. For a GDP that's about 30 billion, it's almost 50% 50, 50 of our GDP going to be invested in a short period of time. So it's critical that we make that decision and allow that money to flow. Yes. I think the second critical thing we have to look at is out of that 15 billion, how much is going to be spent locally? Because as you know, we don't make oil rigs in Uganda. So there's a lot of that technology that's going to be acquired offshore. Mm -hmm. But if we're careful about ring fencing, what can be acquired here? You know, pineapples, chicken, cement, you know, some steel, windows, uh, hotels, catering, there's certain things that are going to be ring fenced for Ugandans. But even then, if we get to a 30% of that 15 billion, so 5 billion spent locally, it's a massive trickle down effect and multiply effect on the economy. Yes. Um, and that actually starts to stimulate growth. Yes. In fact, in our own estimates, we see GDP in 2023 getting up to 10% growth. Wow, but 10, when you said right now it's at six, six and a half. Six and a half. Yeah. GDP will double from 30 billion today to roughly 60 in 2025 if we can get this decision going. That's how important it is. Yeah. But I, I know that the important people who are listening and who are making these decisions recognize how important it is. Yes. And hopefully it will happen in Q3 this year. I'm sure they want it, you know, the important people and, and the decision makers uh, want, it, want it to happen. Uh, and maybe it's a case of protectionism and mm -hmm. how maybe some of those sectors are protected yeah. so that Ugandans get to benefit from the oil industry. I'd heard about the 20 billion and how it's going to trickle down into the economy, mm -hmm. uh, in the services industry especially, you know, for people doing what, even what these guys do, you know, the, the production crew. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of work for everybody. Um, so I think um, uh, Uganda is... I would suppose on the on the poised for poised take off. For, for take off. Mm. It's just the question is, you know, how do we manage it when it happens? Because we don't want a case like our our West African brothers or our brothers down in uh, Southern Africa who uh, uh, I won't say the country because mm. you know we you know we have friends in these places, mm. but who haven't managed their their oil very well mm. and it's 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 caused a disaster. It can be a curse. Uh, if yeah, it's, it's a not, curse. Yeah. It's, it's horrible, you know, mm. when you go to those places, you can't believe that these people have had oil for not just last year, the year before, but for the last 20 years, and they didn't do anything with it mm. other than line a few people's pockets. So I hope that uh, this final investment decision comes fast so that we, you know, uh, tr try and, because, uh, you know, try and galvanize the economy again. Yep. So one of the things that we do on this show is... Uh, mm. uh, uh, is we, we try to support innovators, yeah. young innovators. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way we do it is to uh, amplify what they're doing. And unfortunately, uh, on your show, uh, being the man that you are, we said, no, this space mm. is just for Patrick. <laughs> but um, I know that within Stanbic you have, and I think I've seen it, the Stanbic mm. Business Incubation uh, mm. Program. Yeah. Uh, do you care to share what this is about? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm very happy to talk about the incubator. It's been a, an amazing success. Yes. Uh, so effectively what we're trying to solve for 
is a problem statement, which is 75% of Ugandan SMEs don't make it past their third birthday. That's a huge mortality rate. So we're trying to understand why. Of course, there are a lot of conventional reasons, like I think it's high interest rates. Yes. Um, or it's, but we did the analysis. There were three main issues that these SMEs face. One is that they, they lack the governance and the soft records, financial records, bookkeeping, tax and legal advice, the things that they generally ignore, yes. but that become really paramount in your survivability. Yes. So if you don't have a health and safety policy, for example, you cannot bid uh, for a contract in Total or Sinop. Their first question is, that, you know, what's your health and safety policy? Yes. So we wanted to drum into these SMEs that it's not just about making that quick buck. Yes. Get your house in order. And if you get your house in order, then you have, actually the money will come later. Mm -hmm. The financing will come. Because a lot of the things that we ask for are those soft you know, financial records and governance, etc. And separation of powers. Your, your, your wife is a CFO, the husband's CEO, the son's COO. Mm -hmm. I mean, who's going to check who in that situation? Then your grandfather is the minister. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's no professional keeping the numbers. Yes, yes. So we've been trying to intervene on that. The second other issue we, we found was that these SMEs lack access to markets because most SMEs sell business to business. Yes. Um, having the ability to get them introduced into an ecosystem where they can sell their products to whether it's SAB, Milanaya Breweries or Uganda Breweries or MTN, all these are our corporate clients of ours. So we're trying to use our advantage as a large bank yeah. to get these SMEs in these cohorts and introduce them to market so that they can improve their business and grow their revenue. Yes. Um, so we're going regional now. So last year we graduated um, 200 SMEs, okay. uh, 500 individuals. They go through three months of training. Yes. Then we attach a mentor to them so when they yes. go back in the environment, they don't go back to the old ways of work. Yes. Um, we're going to open regional centers this year in Bara, Mbale, Gulu, and Hoima. Yes. So we want to take it national. We want to get to a point where we're training thousands and thousands of SMEs and really improving and increasing their mortality rate yes. and really start to show locally owned successful businesses that are going from generation to generation. If we can achieve that, I yeah. think that will be a massive uplift for the country. I think even, you know, I've been a victim of it, you know, when I was younger and, and, and stuff like that, is you start a business, uh, maybe I know you get some business and, uh, you, know, we, you know, somehow the idea is good and then you realize that either you have too much that you can't manage or you, you have too little, mm -hmm. too many people you're paying, uh, you're not tax compliant, uh, you're not, you don't have audited books of accounts. Uh, um, you don't you, even know your margins. Yes, A you, lot of times you, don't, you think revenue is profit. Yes, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you think revenue is profit, you haven't really calculated whether you should pay yourself a salary or not, mm -hmm. and then when you actually do that calculation, you, you realize that the, it's a it's, it's loss-making loss business. Mm -hmm. Now, as you go back to 2014, to, to 2015, it happened to a lot of people. Yeah. People, oh my goodness, I'm actually not making money. Those are the things we're intervening yes. in. Yes. Because if you're not keeping records of what money came in, where it went, yeah. you can't price back. You know, if you're pricing word of mouth, you don't know what you price this show for, tomorrow it's a different price. And yes. It, it doesn't lead to sustainability. Yeah. But trying to get small businesses to understand that being compliant is actually a competitive advantage yes. is a very difficult thing in our Ugandan context. Many of them think it's an annoyance. Uh, why do you want this form? Why do you want that? Yes. Well, it's for your survivability. And actually, if you tick those boxes, everything will follow. And so yeah, we're I trying mean, to spread the gospel. You know, like nowadays when you, when you pitch to do a business for any company, the first thing they ask for, give us your tax clearance certificate, your TIN number, NSSF. And, and NSSF, and you're like, huh? Mm. Then you start scrambling, yeah. and your returns, mm -hmm. you know, and your returns. And people don't know how to do that. Mm. And I think, you know, if this, the business incubation is doing that for people, I think the survivability of these businesses will actually have a, a great effect. And if you've said you've graduated... Uh, we did 200 last year. We're going to do more. Yeah. yeah. The other one thing I'll add is uh, I don't want to take full credit for this incubator because we rely a lot on partners. Yes. So we've got a lot of legal firms, accounting firms that do pro bono work for us. Yes. Uh, to come in and run these sessions. So it's a whole ecosystem of people and partners and specialists that we've put together. We just provide the space and we fund the space because the SMEs don't pay for any of this. 
And um, on top of that, you know, we, we, we do not insist that they are stand big clients. In fact, okay. many of them are not. Uh, as long as you're an SME, you are eligible for this incubator. You don't have to be a stand big client. So there's a website for it. People can go website, and apply, etc., and, yeah. and, and go into the business incubation facility. You can see which cohorts are coming the next year. We try to do them in different batches. Yes. So we will do fabricators and welders. Yes. Then we'll go and do transport and logistics, because there's power in actually engaging one particular sector. Yes. And and when they start engaging with each other, they also learn a lot from each other. And I see Stanbic has done a lot of other great things. Uh, I see here there's the Stanbic's 2019 National Schools Championship, yeah. uh, which is uh, empowering job creators of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when we come back from the break, we'll talk about this and wrap it up with a quick brief on uh, Patrick's uh, ascendancy in the banking world. Welcome back to the Cedric Live Show. I'm here with Patrick Muhiri, the MD, Managing Director of Stanbic Bank, Uganda's leading bank. Uh, so Patrick, we're talking about, of course we talked about the incubation facility, but Stanbic has been involved in helping a lot of young people. And of course our country, uh, there are 30 million young people. We talked about the population boom. Mm. You said 1.2 million babies, babies per, year, per, year. per year. So I see that Stanbic, of course you've been involved in sport, I see you mm. involved in rugby, you're involved in football. I think you're the title sponsors of Uganda Cup, Cup. Um, uh, and, and many other initiatives. Yeah. I think you, you, you helped with Zone 5 basketball or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I want to specifically ask about Stanbic's 2019 National Schools Championship, which goes by, I think, the hashtag. It's not a hashtag, but in quotes, empowering job creators of tomorrow. Yeah. Um, wh what is that about? So that's something we've been running, I think, for five years now. It's one yeah. of our marquee CSR projects yeah. because we picked education as a key pillar of our corporate social responsibility. Yeah. Why? It is one of the best returns. If you can invest in the youth, yes. um, it is going to generate the best return. It was also the most ignored. So there's a lot of money from malaria, AIDS, but education was sort of on the sides. So we picked it up, and that's where we spend most of our time. Now, the National Schools Championship is trying to intervene again, in soft skills, yeah. um, because many of these schools basically are just book smarts teaching you how to cram something, regurgitate it. Yeah. But in the real world, we found a mismatch between what's required to be a successful banker or a successful professional. Yeah. Um, it's not about how well you did in math or physics. Yeah. It's how well you engage, how you adapt your thinking to the environment that you're in. Yeah. Uh, so we do debates. We put them through boot camps where they actually have to come up with business ideas, almost like a dragon den, and present those to us. We actually fund the top winning ideas. Many of them go back to their schools and start some catering business or a salon. Mary Hill started a salon which is doing well. Uh, Mooney Girls is doing a catering. They were the winners from last year. Yes. So it also teaches these kids that you know, these ideas to business, there's a process, and you can't skip that process. And it's not about you know, the school piece as well. It's about understanding business, communicating. So we have debating and all of that. It's a fantastic program. Uh, we've scaled it up. Uh, I think we're going to do uh, more than 100 schools this year. Yeah. Um, that, and, but eventually, when we touch all the districts, we do end up touching a lot of kids in the process. Yeah. Uh, and we think it's invaluable in terms of today in the world that we live in. You know, I was sitting somewhere the other day. Actually, no, not the other day, but a while ago. And some people were having a conversation about you. Hmm. And they were talking about Patrick Muir, the, the Stan Big MD, who's done really well in terms of leading the company, uh, in terms of its growth over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Then one of the guys said, uh, yeah, but of course, you know, uh, Patrick, Patrick grew up in America. And so I, I was listening to the conversation. Mm. I, was in, I, was, I was intrigued mm. because I wanted to understand mm. um, why they thought this. Mm. Uh, of course, we've, uh, you know, mm. I've known you for a long time, so I know that's not entirely true. It's not true at all. Uh, yeah, but uh, <coughs> may, may, tell me, 
how do you... Let's, let's work backwards here. Mm. You're the MD of Stanbic. But one thing I do know, uh, which you'll allude to, is tell me, how, how does that happen? You know, mm. Because there are not many mm. local indigenous Ugandan MDs. Of course, quite recently we have, uh, I think, Fabian at um, Centenary Bank, Katamba at Equity Bank, and a couple of Biyama mm. now at mm. KCB. Uh, but you were one of the first ones. Mm. Uh, how do you get to this point in your career? <laughs> it's a very loaded question. Yeah. But I, I'll start at the beginning. And I think in so many ways, I'm a typical Kampala kid from the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Grew up in Akasero, went to Buganda Road for seven years. Yeah. Went to Budo after that for six years. At that point, before my 18th birthday is when I left and went to the U.S. Yeah. Um, and returned 20 years later. So in the 20 years I was in the U.S., um, I mean, a lot of that's where my professional career basically started. Um, so I did investment banking for most of the time I was there. Um, I started off with a small bank called Prudential at the time. A small did, bank? Did that for a, three years. A small years. bank, okay, yeah. a small bank. <laughs> like worth billions. Okay, fine, go ahead. Then I, I went and did, I completed an MBA at Harvard Business School. When I was done with that. I joined Merrill Lynch and Company, which was a leading. You know the way you bank. said Harvard is like you, uh, like you went to Kampala prep somewhere here, and uh, you know it's hard to get into Harvard. Mm. You know how did you get into Harvard? You know what I mean it's difficult. I know you worked hard. I was lucky. A lot of people work hard. I was you lucky. Know. You know it's like winning the lottery. No, anyway, I th I had a good story, and I you know I, I worked hard to yes. to get the right grades to get in. Yeah. Um, and then you were lucky because they, you know, they accept seven, eight percent. So yeah. there's a bit of luck involved. So I yes. can't say, you know, there was any particular reason. Reason, yeah. yeah. Mm. So then I started working in investment banking again in New York for Merrill, which I did for almost ten years. Yes. Then after that, 2008, I moved to London, worked for another bank, and then returned to Uganda in 2012. So okay. that 20 gap, 20 year gap. Uh, but I've been here now seven years, and yes. I can comfortably say it's been a lot of fun. Completely different mind shift in working in an investment bank in New York. It's a bit yeah. slower. No, not slower. It's just a different job. It's a different way it's of doing It's a completely things. different job. And I think you have to adapt into that environment. But I've been able to make my contributions and I'm happy with what I do. But let me ask you something, Patrick. I mean, you go to Harvard, you get an MBA, you go to work on Wall Street, you work for Mary Lynch. You could have retired like three years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, you could have made millions, maybe even billions, I don't know. Maybe you'd be, have your own hedge fund, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you do have your own hedge fund, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. I'm just saying, you know, you could have done anything. Why come back here to, to you know, struggle? You know, we, we, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of, uh, I would say even intrigue to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, because everybody's sort of grabbing at uh, the few positions that are available. Why, why did you choose to come back to Uganda? Well, two things. It was always in my long-term plans. So yeah. when I left 18, I, I always knew I'd come back. I used to test that every five years. Yeah. Am I ready? Is the timing right? Yeah. But it was always in my plans. Secondly, after doing investment banking for almost 20 years, um, you want to try something else. You want to try yeah. something different. And I feel like this role has given me, first of all, it stretched me because it was completely different. Yeah. It was first job in your home country. Um, how are you going to adapt culturally? All eyes on me. Uh, well, I don't know about all eyes on me, but yeah. you have to understand your environment. So yeah. there was a bit of, of that. Secondly, um, I felt like I was making more of a, a personal contribution back yes. doing this. Because I could have stayed in New York. You're right, made a lot of money. But I was just another managing director in a large American investment bank. Yes. But here I feel like I've been able to have a contribution to not only just the country, the bank, um, a lot of uh, young people that we've been able to train and lift up. So it's comforting and rewarding in a very strange way, and that's, yes. in, and that's why I did it. Yeah, yeah well, I think, I think you've set a very good precedent for a lot of people, because there are a lot of Ugandans. You know, people talk about Ugandans, and there are a lot of Ugandans in, in the diaspora working in banking, aviation, aerospace, marketing, sales, whatever it may be, you know, sports, who, who basically just don't want to hear about yeah. coming to Uganda. Uh, sometimes I don't blame them because it is tough here sometimes, mm -hmm. especially with the culture shift. But, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you're a role model for even them. Mm -hmm. And I, I now see a lot of uh, people asking that question, you know. Mm -hmm. I was away for a long time, 
and it was hard for me to come home. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I think coming home, you know, it's it's a good thing. It is absolutely. it is home anyways, you know. Uh, absolutely. And it does bring its um, its advantages to the country. Mm. Now, before we go, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you two things. The first thing is, there's been this drive to market Uganda, you mm. know, from a tourism perspective, from you uh, buy Uganda, build Uganda. Um, sometimes I feel that it, it has its spikes and its, its, its troughs, if you mm. want to say. Mm. But I sometimes feel that there's not a consistent message mm -hmm. that is going out of Uganda. There's great achievements here yeah. and there, you know, Someone does well or something happens, mm. then it dips again. How do you think we can make this message more consistent, much stronger to the rest of the world? That Uganda is one, an invest investment destination, number two, a tourism destination, um, and three, a great place to be anyway, yeah. you know, regardless. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you want to come here and, 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 and live here uh, and, and feed into that 80% agricultural mm. uh, market that we have, you can come. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what are you so I think we, we've got to spend some more time uh, telling our story yes and I think you know if you think about tourism very few people actually go out to visit the beautiful country that we call Uganda yes. um, so it's encourage more Ugandans to actually do local tourism consume ourselves yeah and then yeah. also then you, you have a better picture of, of how beautiful this country is but then you can market it um, because there's a lot of beauty in Uganda. I mean, I've traveled many, many countries, but I still enjoy. And I know I'm biased because I'm Ugandan, but there's some things that you just don't see anywhere else. Um, so that is one. Uh, how do we get that going? On the investment side, uh, again, it's telling our story. If you go back and look at Uganda and its policies and how it liberalized, Uganda today is probably the second most liberal country in Africa after South Africa. Yes. In the region by far, um, you know, capital account is open, uh, no exchange controls, independent central bank, you know, monetary policy that, you know, fights inflation. Um, you can bring a million dollars in in the morning, take it out in the afternoon. Yes. All these are great things. Um, if you look at the top 10 taxpayers, many of them are multinationals. So it kind of has a great story yes. in terms of an investment climate. We just need to tell we that story We just need properly. to tell the story. Yes. I think we tell small tidbits of it, um, but if we can package it properly, um, there's a very, very good story to tell. Patrick Mohiri, thank you very much for coming on the Cedric Live Show on UBC. And uh, congratulations on all you've achieved with Stan because they're managing director these last few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> very much for coming, Patrick. Thank you, Cedric. It was a pleasure. Thanks very much, guys. Tune in next week. Capital. Uh. It's the it's your whole live in the capital. Live in the capital.